All right, everyone who's listening to this, this is not a drill. This is the first episode of Face-Offs and Friendship. I'm Greg Renlian, and this is my esteemed partner, Jerry Raganese. Jerry, how are we feeling, bud? Feeling good. Great to be here. Uh, really excited to bring you guys not just uh, face-off content, but bring in uh, some information around the lacrosse world and current events in general. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, people have been asking us for years to do a podcast, and we've been talking about it for a while. We really wanted to dive in because even though podcasts are becoming a thing and obviously a lot of announced podcasts lately, we wanted to kind of give things from a different perspective. One, there's not really a voice for face-offs, right? So we wanted to give people kind of like an inside view on not just playing it and coaching it, but we're also guys that try to bridge the gap between the face-off aficionados and the people in the lacrosse world in general that don't understand it. So I feel like... Yes, this is a podcast for that, and there will definitely be a place for that. But I also think that we're going to be discussing a broad range of topics, and I think we're going to try and have fun with it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think just peeling back the uh, the curtain of what goes on in the, the face-off athlete's mind, as well as just see how those guys are feeling when they hear about rule changes and stuff like that. But, you know, not just face-off topics. Uh, you know, more along the lines of lacrosse, what products are coming out? What are we excited about? What's going on in, in the world of sports in general? Um, so we're really excited to be top, tackling a whole bunch of topics there. Um, we can't wait yeah. to bring on our first uh, exciting guest today, who will remain anonymous for a little bit longer, but we're excited to bring him in. Yeah, he'll, be, he'll remain, <laughs> remain anonymous until we announce on Instagram before you actually hear this podcast so people are going to know Jared people are yeah, gonna know. Well, you know. <laughs> but anyway so basically so you have an idea of how we're going to do this uh our our idea behind this is to keep things moving we'll basically do it in in segments so every single podcast uh episode is going to have us discussing you know current events in sport current events maybe in sports in general something that kind of maybe blurs the lines between lacrosse and sports and then we're going to get into face-off specific stuff so uh, one of the things we're going to discuss today, we're going to kick off with, is something that I threw up on Twitter, um, and Lacrosse Twitter has has gotten after it a little bit today. I know Paul Carcaterra posted it up on his Instagram and his Twitter, uh, is the idea of a draw circle in men's lacrosse. So then we will move forward and we'll always try to have some kind of interview, bring on somebody. Now, I know in the lacrosse world, usually it's a lacrosse person, but we're going to have a very wide range. My goal with this whole podcast is to get Jerry's dad on the mic at some point. That's the whole reason I talked Jerry into doing this. He didn't know it until this very moment, and I wish you saw his face. Uh, what do you think about getting Big Jer on the on the mic? There's nothing my dad does better than talking, so I mean, he'd be more than happy to, <laughs> to, to, to jump right down. Yeah, and then we will finish every week using the hashtag FOASK on Twitter and Instagram. Um, we are going to be selecting our favorite questions to answer and yes face off specific is great but lacrosse in general ask us anything we're we want this to be a wide scoping podcast that even though it comes from face off guys uh, we want to give you guys whether you're you know jerry obviously is a is an owner of pro athletics i've i've delved into the strength training world that's where my background comes from so i'm sure we can give you guys some outlook on plenty of stuff so um let's talk about why we're doing our first episode uh today what event are we at? LaxCon 2020. We're actually sitting in Philadelphia right now at the Marriott Hotel downtown. Jer, what do you love most about this particular weekend? Um, it's funny. Lacrosse is not just a, a centralized hotbed sport anymore. Uh, we're all over the country, all over the world. Um, I know I have some friends from Japan that are in town, um, friends from California, friends from the, the, the South, that everybody congregates this weekend and you know all those phone calls and facetimes and text messages and dms of just back and forth hey really excited to see you you know we made it you know it's it's that time of year again to see everybody you know go down on the floor talk business but it's you know it's really just exciting just to see everybody and see how everybody's doing that's that's my favorite part of uh of laxon yeah absolutely i think the celebration of the sport in general is the cool part you know you have the john Donowskis of the world who are revered and then you have um, you know, fourth graders that are running around trying to figure out what the next shooting head is mm -hmm. going to be from one of the vendors. So you have every style and, and participant of the sport. I think the cool thing, for the most part, is the humble approach. You had, like I said, you know, for, uh, Coach Danowski, for instance, Coach Danowski gets a chance to talk to people, and even though you'll see p coaches will regard Coach Danowski as kids would regard us, 
right? They're almost like, oh my God, like I can't wait to see what this guy has to say. And I think that's the cool thing about the sport is you get a little bit of everything. We get to go talk to the guys at Cascade. We get to go stop by uh, the East Coast Lax um, <laughs> tent, yeah. which is always buzzing with craziness. I'm actually excited to see what they have uh, in store for everybody this year because they always yeah. they always blow it out. And then, of course, as face-off guys, the last few years has been awesome because there's always some kind of innovation. Uh, I remember we got our first look at the 2F uh, from Shrink King a couple years ago mm-hmm. before it hit the, you know, now the Gate Brothers are back in town, which is great uh, for the sport. Uh, they always come up with crazy innovation, and, and obviously they have the Gate draw head that's going to be on display. So we're going to get our hands on that finally. Yeah, a lot of so, buzz for that uh, right now. Yeah. Um, kids are already asking me, hey, do you have a prototype? Can I check it out? And hopefully we'll get our, uh, you said we are going to be able to see yeah, that. Yes, so and the answer to that is 100%. We, uh, there will be Beast Labs coming out on both the Gate Draw and the Mark Two F from String King, the stiff version. Uh, those are going to be. We're going to get our hands on those, and we're going to have those at our draw days coming up the next couple of weeks. So that's a cool thing. Obviously, uh, Jerry and I are Face Off Academy coaches, and we run our draw days every single week. So it's cool for us to be able to implement these things to get good reviews from the masses. Um, one of my things that I love about LaxCon is all the unveilings. Right, we're going to unveil the fact that we're doing a podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the PLL just is going to be doing their two podcasts as well. And then on the floor, you're going to have everybody announcing equipment stuff. You're going to have, we're going to have a great discussion with officials. We always do. I love talking to the officials about what they see the trend is uh, in the sport. I know a couple of officials have talked about the face-offs in the international rules, closely mirroring the NCA rules uh, coming up. So what are some stuff, like if somebody's coming to LaxCon and they've never been here before, what would your recommendation be for your approach to the weekend? Um, I think getting the vendor village out of the way fast is important. Um, you know, go walk around, see, see the stuff, get that out of the way and then meet people. I think that's the, that's the best part of this sport is that people, uh, from all different walks of life are in this game. Um, yeah, the helmets are cool, but you know, you're going to see more pictures of those. You didn't have to drive all the way down to Philadelphia to see helmets. You didn't have to drive all the way down to Philadelphia to see gloves. You should be meeting people, different positions from different countries, and just explaining, you know, what your thoughts on the game are and, and hearing their side of the game and how do they get into it. And you'll, you know, as much as I thought that that was kind of uh, a bizarre thing to do early on, I've forged some lifelong friendships just from this convention floor. That's, without without even really trying. It's a great point, actually. The vendor the vendor village becomes crazy mm-hmm. midway through Saturday. Yep. So if you can get in early, I would tell if you you want to make a veteran move, get in early on Friday and around this time, like three thirty on a Friday, go check out the vendor village. Uh, pretty much everything that you need to see is going to be set up there, so you get the chance to kind of get one on one talk with some of the vendors, which is actually a great point. I know U.S. Lacrosse is always there uh, talking about what's upcoming for what they have lined up. So basically what Jerry and I do every year is we get in Friday, we hang out, we go check out the floor to see old friends and catch up. And then Saturday morning we always present. To, uh, Saturday at 8.30 a.m. we'll be presenting this year. What is the seventh year? I, I think it's, it's the seventh it's year. Just, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, seventh year that we've been here, guys, uh, in a row. And we always love the fact, you know, it's funny because our stuff is always fresh because they change the face-off rules every, every two years. years. So we always have new stuff to talk about, which is awesome. So, you know, that's kind of the reason behind this, uh, and that's why we're doing this. As far as the, before we go to a break, as far as the, the LaxCon situation goes, who do you think benefits the most from LaxCon? Uh, a presenter, uh, a, a coach who's trying to learn, uh, a vendor, or just a kid? Well, I think, I think there's symbiotic relationships. Um, as a vendor myself, not at Laxon, but just as a, as a provider of the sport, um, I want feedback in real time from my customers. So, you know, if you're unveiling a new product, a lot of these guys have like, you know, demo booths where you can try shooting or you can try the gloves on and they'll give you information immediately back. Oh, I don't like the thumb on this glove. Okay, well, let's write this down. I think that's super important. And then vice versa, these kids get to come in and try out the new product that you know no one's going to see until it gets released in the summertime or they get their hands on a sideline swap one from a guy who's selling his stuff from Duke. Um, and then as a presenter, I really enjoy coming down here and getting to show just what's new, how, how to help these guys, maybe not in hotbed areas, on how to coach their kids and, and proper refereeing technique and, and good stuff like that. And then on... A relationship uh, 
with the clientele who come to these things. Uh, it's important for us to have that face-to-face um, conversation and just, you know, and just shoot the breeze with these people as well. I think that's super important. It gives a, it gives a personality to the face that they're following on social media p- platforms. And we're just people just like they are. And, you know, we just happen to know something that they're looking for. And maybe if they're in, you know, maybe they're a pharmacist and I want to know about pharmacy, I'm going to go to the pharmacy convention and ask them what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if there's a pharmacy convention here, that'd be awesome because half the people here are sick. It's that time of year. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so, hey, okay, guys, listen, we're really pumped about this podcast. That's our first, we're going to go to our first break. But when we come back, we're going to start talking about some face off stuff, including the draw circle. Welcome back to Face Offs and Friendship Podcast. I'm Greg. This is Jerry. Jer, what do we have next? Uh, next, we're going to tackle the controversial subject of. The newly dropped face-off circle uh, that we just rolled out on social media and just kind of some of the feedback we've been getting. Yeah, you know, it's funny. (laughs) We always laugh because... So, I drew a diagram. I made a diagram on my computer on PowerPoint. It's actually pretty good. Thanks, man. I did it on PowerPoint. Uh, Shout out to Rob Littell of Tribe 7 who taught me how to use PowerPoint. And um, I, I, I dropped that. I sent it to Kark. I posted it on Instagram and Twitter. And uh, with after dropping that nuke in lacrosse Twitter, um, the first question is always, what are these rules going to be? <laughs> Just calm down, guys. Okay, so here's here's the here's the honest truth. Since we put it since we dropped it today, uh, Friday in the morning, 90% of on Twitter, if you go on Twitter, 95% of the people that responded have been positive about it, whether it's coaches, refs, Um, players, blah, blah, blah. On Instagram, though, there is a dumpster fire of children crying in the corner. (laughs) Freaking out. Uh, So here's a couple things. Uh, I I, I had one person ask me today, like, as a face-off guy, I'm shocked that you would be doing this to take away, um, you know, the importance of the face-off guys because face-off guys work really hard. I'm going to blow your minds. We know exactly how hard face-off guys work. Uh, the whole point of this, just so you understand, why would we come up with a rule change? The rules every two years are changed for face-off guys. Dominant face-off guys. How do we change the rules for face-off guys? Those guys. Blah, 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 blah. We wanted to take the discussion and change it from should we get rid of face-offs or not and move it to how can we make it more three-on-three. So what you saw was an immediate pivot on social media away from should the face-off exist to, of course it should exist, but how, where should we put wings to make it a more three-on-three face-off? And I think the problem for people, for the most part, is they scream about how things are unfair. It's unfair that Yale gets the ball more than Penn State. People really don't care about unfair, in my opinion. I think people care about excitement. So, for instance, if a face-off player wins a clamp, turns and pops it to himself 20 out of 22 times in a game, People will be bored by that. But if three guys versus three guys and the ball's popped out and there's a huge scrum and Yale happens to win 20 out of 22 faceoffs, I don't think people would complain because no, it's a three-on-three. Three. And now you have a storyline. Exactly. It's incredible. How are they still doing this? Yeah, so like, for instance, you watch, you watch football. If an, if an offensive team runs the ball 100 times, never throws it, and gains three to four yards every time and dominates in a 17-7 to seven win, people will be like, that game sucked. That was so boring. Even though it was a completely dominant offensive performance. You take it and instead the offense is just painting corners, throwing dimes all over the place, running trick plays, and they still only win by 10 points. Everyone would say, wow, that we, that game was incredible. That offense was amazing. Even if they happen to gain less first downs. People want to see excitement. So, our idea behind the draw circle, and this schematic is up on my Twitter, it's on Jerry's Twitter, it's on the Faceoff Academy Instagram. If we take the wing lines, because we're not in love with them, they serve no other purpose, get rid of them, and instead use the exact circle that is used on a soccer field. A wing line to the center dot on a lacrosse field is 20 yards. If you get rid of that, and instead you have a 20 yard in diameter circle, now you're 10 yards away from the faceoff guy. So what we're saying is, is you use PLL rules, right? So let's look at from the top to bottom what people complain about on face-offs. One is the setup. Right? What do they say about the setup? Takes too long. Takes too long. If you watch a PLL game this summer, 
we had four different marks on the field. The ball was down already on a dot. There were two perpendicular lines off the midline. The refs had their foot on the line. You basically, they would say down. We line the top of our head right up to the ref's foot. They backed out. They said set and whistle just like the college mechanic. We were in and out in, a, in seconds. The other part of it is keep your hands off the plastic strictly because now the ball is lined up at the top third of your head, which means that when you clamp against somebody, it's the floppy part of the plastic, mm -hmm. right? When's the only time the ball gets locked in a 50-50 on a face-off? Whether a guy has his hands up on the plastic or if it's down in the lower U of the stick, those are the only times you're going to get lockups. Right, so the ball gets locked up because you're either putting it too low on the head. So you get rid of that adjustment. You take it out of the official's hand so they don't have to worry about it. Now it'll be nice and consistent. So you've created a face-off that's faster to go down. You've created a face-off where the ball will come out quickly because the ball is lined up with the floppy part of the plastic. So now what you're taking is, okay, if a guy, if the ball's going to come out quick, now we're going to give the three-dimensional chess option of wings being able to go anywhere they want before the whistle around that circle. So now you've basically told face-off guys, your mechanics are the same, your technique's the same. The only difference is now you have to be more of a field general and you have to be willing to pop the ball out to free space, right? So what is the downside? Let's play devil advocate. What's the downside to a draw circle? Uh, downside to a draw circle, in my opinion, is some face-off guys will complain that guys are on top of them too fast. And that's only going to make the cream rise to the top, making guys have to be better athletes and, and more coordinated with their wings, bringing back the three-on-three -three requests that we hear. Yeah. Um, another downside is maybe guys don't know how to coach this because it's new. But guess what? It's new for everybody, so we've leveled the playing field. Yeah, you know. And that's the other thing, guys. You have to understand what Jerry and I always do is, and I was talking about Car. I was talking to Paul Carcaterra about this in 2015 in the MLL. I think it's safe to say I figured out faceoffs in which you could bury the ball in the back of your throat and run it out in the back of your stick. At my own detriment, after a record-breaking year, I was a very strong advocate for getting rid of the ball in the back of the stick because I thought it was bad for the game. So it's, we're we're in a very interesting position. Because if we stick up for face-offs, let's be honest, you and I are basically the only ones who do that, right? A lot of guys out there like to make money blowing whistles, but very few aren't going to run for the hills when it comes to sticking up for our position. We get buried by the lacrosse community. If we stick up for the lacrosse community and we come up with rules like this or ideas that will help engage everyone and get rid of arguing about face-offs, the strong face-off community comes at us. Mm -hmm. So at our own detriment, we're saying we've got this whole thing figured out to a science, but we want to tweak it so it's better for everybody. Um, you have to understand where we're coming from. Now, here's the other part that you're not thinking about. If we don't do this, if we don't come up with an idea and help the NCAA come up with something that works for everybody, they're going to try to get rid of it. So uh, instead of us sitting back and saying, you know what, go ahead and just keep guessing every two years without any face-off input, Eventually, more guys in that rules committee room are going to have bad face-off guys than guys who have good ones. And there's going to come out a rule, and just like 1979, they're going to get rid of the face-off, and it's going to be a mess all over again. And then they're going to put it back in at some point, and it's going to be another weird version. So our goal is, let's get out in front of it, do something that keeps the integrity of the position. But if you're a college coach, like, we love Jerry Byrne, right? Mm -hmm. He's at Harvard now. Jerry Byrne, not a huge face-off specific, like, Fogo type of guy. But imagine what a guy with Jerry Byrne's brain could do if you said, hey, we're moving the wings in, and now we're playing three-dimensional chess, and you're able to move them anywhere. I mean, he would come up with all kinds of ways to face off correctly with an athletic face-off guy. He would double pull sometimes. I mean, that's what we're looking for. We're trying to make it more coachable for guys who don't understand clamps. Because I've, I've spoken to uh, Matt Madelon at Princeton. And he said, very honestly, like, our issue is we all know we need a top 10 face-off guy. But none of us know how to coach it. So we're, we're handcuffed. If we do this, I think more coaches would be able to coach it. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think every coach knows how to coach a long stick midi. A lot of coaches know how to coach D middies. Now you're just putting them in situations where, hey, listen, you're going to cut the break. You're going to cut the backside because this guy just tends to only go forward okay fine let's set up a wall and now you're giving up backdoor play and then you got to make you make some adjustments but that's the beauty of this is that 
you open up a lot more boxes as opposed to just allowing a guy just to keep going forward, keep going forward, keep going forward. Because if a guy goes out the front door three times in a row, all right, you just set your two guys up front. Now you got a wall. Yeah. Okay, now he goes out the back door. All right, well, let's use our coaching brain, which we've never had better college coaches in the game. These guys can figure that out. They can figure out how to cut up a pizza. That's yeah. basically what they're trying to do. Yeah, you're right. And you know what? Here's the other thing is I think it's going to give rise to styles of face-off guys. Mm-hmm. So, like, in, in football, that analogy, again, you have option quarterbacks, RPOs, then you have pocket passers. So now what you're going to have is you're going to have face-off guys that – uh, can stand, go neutral grip, can rake, pinch and pop, all that stuff. Then you have guys who are on a knee and they like to clamp, go to themselves. You have other guys that might be pinpoint and are really good at sniping spots of the field, which means that you could literally set up routes for your wings. I think this is the solve. Maybe we don't have to go to a circle. Maybe we can go to just closer wings like mm-hmm. the PLL. But I do think that it's up to us to come up with some kind of idea that then takes the focus off of changing the rules for the face-off guys and moves it out to a group uh, situation. So that's kind of why we did it. Yeah, and I'm really excited for this. I mean, even if it just gets the conversation rolling towards something like this, at least we know it's not going backwards. This is at least forward progress at, to get wings in as opposed to taking away knee-down face-offs. Okay, you, take, you get rid of that. I know in college I didn't go on a knee once. Yeah. Let's get rid of motor grip. Okay, your first half of your career was was standing neutral grip so there's there's no hard ban on anything that you can do to fix this which people seem to think the heads are a problem they think the the stances are a problem it's it's just because one guy tends to rise to the top every year and coaches don't like that the water's going to settle anyways because we have guys we've been training for six to eight years all coming up and the waters the waters are going to even you know it's yeah. I, everybody knows about the tds and the trevors um and everybody talks about that but that's one guy out of the 53 in division one lacrosse yeah. um and this will certainly help schools that don't have strong recruiting and face-off guys this makes you not have to worry about bringing in two three face-off guys a class you can sit on a good guy and say all right instead of instead of getting two face-off guys this class let's go get a super athletic and dynamic long stick nitty mm-hmm. and that will be the the straw that stirs our drink yeah. in that situation yeah. and that's that's making it more dynamic adding a layer to our game the women's game already has a draw circle why not kind of add it and also another thing to think about if you have a multi-use field for a lot of these colleges you do a lot of high schools you're basically just using the soccer circle anyway you're mm-hmm. getting rid of wing lines you're losing two lines so that's just something to think about. If you have questions about that throughout this week, go to uh, throughout this month, actually, if you go, uh, go ahead and use the hashtag F-O-A-S-K, F-O-A-S-K, and, you know, ask us some questions. We want to answer it. We'll answer it on our social, and we'll also answer it maybe uh, next episode. So we're going to take a break. We come back. RJ from the PLL is going to be our first ever guest. You don't want to miss it. What's up, Face Offs and Friendship Podcast? <laughs> Hey guys, welcome back to Face Offs and Friendship. We have our first guest ever. Um, you guys know him as PLL RJ. RJ, how do you pronounce your last name? Kaminsky. Okay, it's kind of interesting that um, people only see RJ as like these <laughs> incredibly souped up, happy go lucky face of PLL. But we were just talking before we started recording about how somebody who doesn't play lacrosse at all is so. Uh, just welcome and part of the normal lacrosse world. So that's what we kind of wanted to get into. So welcome to the podcast, my man. Thanks for having me. I'm really honored to be the first guest, guys. Yeah, and you know, uh, couldn't think of a better guy to, to come in on the uh, on the first day here. Um, you know, you kind of live a, a double life, so to speak. You know, there's a, there's an RJ who's on camera and there's an RJ who's off camera. Who I like both, um, but we wanted to give uh, the the listeners the opportunity to hear a little bit more about the RJ who's off camera. Sweet. I'd like to think they're really similar. Yeah, well, that, that's going to be part of our question, so it's Correct. actually a great point. So, let's hear first, how did you end up in the lacrosse world? What was your first taste of it? Great question, because I didn't grow up playing. So, I was in high school, I was a junior, and a friend of mine who I work with now, Tyler, Tyler Steinhardt, who you, who you all know, uh, at the Premier Lacrosse League, 
he came to me and some of my other friends, Brett Roberts as well, with an idea. He said, hey, I want to raise money for veteran charities, and I want to use lacrosse as the vehicle uh, to fundraise. And he said, and I want this to be a unique concept, so we're going to do a 24-hour lacrosse event. Your team comes out, plays for an hour, fundraises $750, and we play all through the night uh, in 24 hours in total. And he was like, I want you to come on and do the marketing and, and social media around it and come and broadcast for the whole 24 hours because I had just started a radio program at our high school, which was Boys Latin. So I said yes. I'm really glad I said yes because the first event was a success. The first goal was $10,000. I think the first game we raised over $120,000. <laughs> we expanded a year after that into Long Island. And then, long story short, we began traveling across the country. We expanded Shootout for Soldiers all the way to the West Coast in Dana Point, California. Uh, we expanded to Boston. We expanded all over the place. And I was able to travel with my best friends in an RV, putting on this incredible 24-hour lacrosse event, raising millions of dollars for our veterans at the same time, and really getting to know uh, to your question, the lacrosse community and the military community as well, and the tie in there is 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 pretty is a pretty special one. Yeah, it's actually incredible. We were just talking about that at our national showcase. There are so many veterans and uh, first responders, and my dad was really impressed with it. And we'll we'll get uh, more into that a little bit later. But if you guys uh, who are listening, if you haven't seen Sticks for Sol- uh, Shoot for Soldiers, you guys really need to check it out on social because it is a awesome awesome event. Um, now, how many total, I, I guess, what do they call them, games or events? Uh, we call, call them events. So we, we, we expanded to 12 at one point. So we had 12, 12 cities. We traveled to each one. So we knocked out several per month, and we traveled in an RV across the country. Awesome. Uh, and there's been, been this incredible team that is, has largely taken over the operations uh, since uh, we, Tyler and I have gotten more heavily involved in full-time at the Premier Lacrosse League, uh, and the team's done a really great job spearheaded by Tyler's sister, Gabby Steinhardt. Uh, who's a real workhorse, and she, she's been doing a great job leading it so far uh, since Tyler and I and Brett have moved on in our full time with the PLL. Yeah, yeah. so I've, uh, I've been working with Gabby on the uniform side of things, which is uh, a feather in my cap, which I'm really excited about. Yeah, you do That's, great work on the jerseys. It's my, it's my favorite account by far. And you guys, you guys have a, I mean, I remember we did like 5,000 pennies, and you know, I was like, wow, this is, this is a big movement. And then seeing those big checks that you guys do, uh, do bring in for those guys is, is, tremendous and like i said gabby is a pit bull she works super hard so the program is in good hands yeah. absolutely okay so shoot out for soldiers you become you get hired by the pll mm-hmm. so now what's your reaction the first time paul mentioned to you we're going to start this new pro league so i had heard rumblings of it while mm-hmm. i was at the lacrosse network which, which was my first gig out of college i yeah. went to maryland i was a broadcast journalism major so i had some experience shooting myself and editing but I was doing more news, so I didn't really have a chance to inject my personality into the videos that I was creating. But I had a chance to do that at TLN, and I started putting out YouTube videos once a week, learned how difficult it was to be yourself on camera, but got better and better at it, and I really, really enjoyed doing it as a career. And when I heard of these rumblings, I thought, okay, wow, no better person to lead this than a mind like Paul and his brother Mike, who I had met once or twice before. So once I got the offer from them, I was pretty sold. Uh, that I was going to just come over, make the move out west, and continue what I was doing in a similar fashion at Lacrosse Network, which is taking guys like yourself off the field, sometimes on the field, but getting the audience to know the personalities of the players uh, through the lens. So taking these guys out, uh, whether we're going and getting food or whether we're going shopping, uh, I've developed uh, a bit of a skill in the space for bringing out guys' personalities and making them more comfortable in front of the camera because being in front of the camera is really scary for, for some of these athletes, not just lacrosse players, everybody. The camera can freak people out. So I've, I have kind of used, I used that skill that I developed in lacrosse network, brought it over the PLL, um, and was really welcomed by, by a lot of the pros in the league and was able to tell some pretty incredible stories and, and get our fans to know the incredible guys that are in our league. Yeah, and you do it so easily. And I think people people who are at home, you have to understand, the RJ you see on the camera, and you alluded to it before, that's how RJ is, right? So, like, RJ doesn't, like, get himself ready to go on camera. It just happens, and he continues his sentence. So that's what's so cool is because you would think, and we made this assumption, too, when we started the FOA, that kids are coming out of college, they're in a social media world, they just know how to do this. Mm-hmm. And it's shocking, actually, they don't. It's a skill that has to be learned in talking in front of a camera, talking on mic, you know, ourselves coaching and, and projecting our voices at demos and whatnot. Mm-hmm. So you're in the PLL, and through we, we see you on camera. 
But tell people about like the stuff that happens off camera during the actual solid week. What does that kind of work involve for you? We're consistently brainstorming different ways that we can bring out the personalities and the backgrounds of our pros because we've we've realized one we have a lot of pros in this league that have incredible backstories. Connor Farrell, for example, him coming over from playing football at LIU Post and becoming a lacrosse player is an interesting one. Look, football is a core sport, one of the four core sports. If his story can appeal to a lot of football players out there to potentially go after this position uh, in, a, in a face-off specialist, that's incredible, and that's a chance to pick up net new fans. So being able to tell Connor's story, and uh, Colin and Samir did that uh, in their team in producing the training camp documentary, uh, which is where we really introduced Connor and his love of milk and coming from uh, his background with football, mm -hmm. and that was really kind of the birth of the brand that he started to build at PLL. Mm -hmm. yeah. But it's, uh, it's during the week, Greg, to answer your question more specifically, it's thinking about ways that we can continue to tell these unique stories of the pros in our league and using those stories to attract new fans to the sport. Because lacrosse is so small, um, so microscopic in the grand scheme of things, even in this country, there's still so millions of people that have no idea what's going on in the field out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, but luckily now they're seeing it more on TV and they're getting exposed to it and we're getting a chance to hook in new eyeballs. We want to make sure that those stories are out there for them to resonate with these guys and give it a chance, give uh, give pro lacrosse a chance and sit down and perhaps watch a, watch a game. Yeah, and I think we can all speak for guys who know Paul. I think the, the cool thing about it is we all know him, we all consider him a friend. Um, Paul and Mike don't do anything without thinking about it first. And I think that's why overnight, you know, 150 players started playing. I think you traveled all the way across the country. Uh, Hartzell, um, Cal, like all these guys are all coming across the country w without even thinking twice about it because they trust the mm -hmm. process. You doing this has obviously been an awesome, I think you are the perfect person. It, it, you're, it's indicative of the perfect person finding the right situation to do what they do best. Now, give us a couple things that if you weren't doing this, what would you see yourself doing right now? If I wasn't doing this, I most likely would be in a news reporting role, which I would I would be happy about, yeah. sure, uh, because I get to be on camera and I get to express some personality here and there. But largely the personality displayed by news reporters nowadays, like in a scene or in the in the studio, is largely it's corny. It's like tossing to yeah. another reporter and stuff like You can't really get the audience to know you. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, for example, if you guys see local news reporters around town, you kind of, oh, I, 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 I've seen that. I, that's a familiar face. But if you have nothing to go up and chat with them about, same if you saw a movie star, if you saw Brad Pitt in the street, you, you've seen his movies that he's in, but you don't know much about him personally because the content you watch, he's playing someone else. But on YouTube and the content that we put out and we're able to put out with our pros on a consistent basis, we form relationships with the people that are watching on the other side of the screen. They're learning about what we like. They're learning about what we did growing up. They're learning about how we interact uh, on a daily basis. So when they see us, they have several things to chat with us about. Just like you guys, we're here at LaxCon, there's a ton of kids out there that come, and adults alike, that come up to you guys because they've seen your content and they, they have some things to chat with you about. You put your takes out there on social media, you, you converse with the audience on a daily basis, you ask questions, you have conversations with them. So when they see you, they think of you as a friend and they think they know you. They don't just see you as some uh, figure on the other side of the screen that they're finally seeing in person. Yeah, and I think you have done a good job and the PLL of proving what we were saying for years is that lacrosse fans are loyal to the players that they see as mm -hmm. opposed to the teams they cheer for. Mm -hmm. And we always said that people come to see the players. And you're doing a good job of amplifying not just a player's own personal market and his marketability, but also uh, getting people in the seats because they see stories. And I think you're doing a phenomenal job of that. Now, one thing that we do want to ask you before we go to our, our final break here mm -hmm. is, what are you most excited for? Now that there's a season under your belt, what are you so excited for in the second season coming up for the PLL? I'm really excited for more people to give pro lacrosse a chance to watch that first game. Because nowadays, I think we see it at the participatory level at various sports, soccer, baseball, football. We see some decline there. We also see some decline in some attendance of some other core four sports. And I think to myself, one, going to a PLL game is affordable uh, for a family, which is getting increasingly difficult for professional baseball oh, and football. You go to, really you go to a Yankees game, and it's like uh, you're, you got 
four hundred dollars just to sit down. Never I, mind, you know, beer for dad, a hot dog for kids. Parking, I mean, it's insane, yeah. right? So we want people to come out and have that first experience in person, but we're also giving people that chance on social media to see the PLL, and we're giving that chance on television with having at least one game every weekend on NBC Sports, a chance to pick up new viewers. Because I'm really convinced that a general sports fan, when they flip on NBC Sports and they see you guys playing, they see the Redwoods on TV and they see Ryan Boyle communicating with a player on the field, and they see the incredible athleticism that's going down and the fast, spa- the fast pace of the game, they're going to be hooked. Oh, yeah. at, the very, at the very least, they're going to be interested in what's going on momentarily before fl- flipping the channel if yeah. they don't tune in to watch the full game. So I'm really excited for our product to be seen by more folks that haven't been exposed to it, and I'm excited for them to be hooked by it because I think with the broadcast we have now with NBC... It's top of the line. I think the access we bring on between social and our broadcast is the best in professional sports. So I think we're poised, especially with how small lacrosse is in the grand scheme of things, we're poised for, for some incredible success for attracting new fans. Yeah. I mean, as an aside, Ryan Boyle and Brendan did an amazing job. Oh, tremendous. All down so the field. great, man. Um, the presentation blew our minds this year. So I'm excited for what they're going to have season two. You have done an amazing job. You are definitively part of the lacrosse culture. And, you know, I know I can speak for myself. I thoroughly enjoy every time I get to see you. So you've done an amazing job. I want to really thank you for coming on. Thanks, our Greg. Podcast. Appreciate that. Uh, where can they follow you outside of uh, the PLL vlogs? Uh, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, at RJ Kaminsky, underscore on Instagram. Same on Twitter. Uh, but you can... You can see enough of me on the PLL channels <laughs> at PLL. I feel like people will get enough of me there. Uh, but I wish you guys luck with the pod. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, thanks a lot, brother. All right, hey, we're going to go to a break. When we come back, we're going to go with FOA Ask, so you guys can ask your questions, and we'll be answering them. Welcome back to the Faceoffs and Friendship podcast. Uh, I'm Greg Renlian. I'm here with Jerry Raganese. And basically what we're going to do every single episode is we're going to take your guys' questions from that month. So... Pay attention to The Face Off Academy on Instagram. Follow us on there. And when we post, you guys can use the hashtag F-O-A-S-K, which is F-O-A-S-K. And we will then take those questions. And Jerry and I will just rapid fire, and we'll take turns answering them. So we'll pick our favorites, and we'll go back and forth, kind of like uh, PTI. And we're going to go ahead and get started here. Jerry, you ready to roll? I'm ready to roll, and I All guess right. I'll uh, I'll fire off the first question. Okay. Uh, Mikey Beast thirty six says, "Favorite color lightsaber?" Wow, that's a great question. At the end, oh, I can't. Spoil. We're, we're going to spend like forty five minutes on lightsabers. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> okay, so if you haven't seen the most recent Star Wars spoiler coming up, by the way, it's a really good movie. And if so, stop listening for the next ten seconds. My favorite color lightsaber is yellow. Uh, like Ray had at the very end of the final episode. Okay. Now, I'm going to go with another question for you. Um, so, Jack H. Bird says, do you, feel, do you ever feel off your game for any given period of time? And how have you gone about fixing that physically and mentally? Um, I think that's a great question, Jack. Um, you know... Uh, lacrosse is a, at least professionally, is a summer sport. So sometimes we'll go multiple months at a time without taking reps for, say, uh, a professional level opponent. Um, so, you know, that first week you're back actually on the grind. You know, you get to camp and you're not really sure if you, it's funny, we've all brought that up before is, uh, do I still have it? Do I still have the hands? Mm. Um, and I think the best way to counteract that is to make sure that you never go dull. Um, you keep the blade sharp and you don't always have to do a full on grind on the blade. You can just make sure you have your stick in your hands five minutes a day, do a couple quick clamps, a couple pro hops, work on your defensive exits. That way you never are putting the stick down. And especially in a sport like lacrosse, no different than playing wall ball, working on your face off technique all the time and not for, don't burn a hole in your carpet, but working on your face off technique all the time is absolutely imperative. And if I feel like I'm not able to do that, whether it's an injury or something like that, Always go back to film. Film is the number one asset you have as a face-off guy. It tells no lies. It shows you exactly what you're doing wrong, shows exactly what your opponent's doing right. So if you can break down film, even if you're injured or, or can't get to your stick for some reason, that is a, certainly a, a great way to stay sharp all year long. All right, let's go to the next question. 
the legend, Anthony Kelly, Commando or Predator? Oh, man, that's tough. Tale as old as time. I'm, I'm going to tell you what. Predator works for me um, just because the antagonist is so legendary. So, you know, <laughs> I mean, Predator, you have an alien that's literally called Predator. So, like, it's designed to hunt. And Arnold Schwarzenegger beats it um, because he's got really big biceps. And that's what we've learned from that is if you have really big arms, you can pretty much beat any interstellar opponent. All right. Do you have anything to follow up on? <laughs> I think you nailed it. <laughs> All right. Cool. Hey, um, let's see. Um, okay. So Nick MD.77 asks, what can an athlete from California do to get college recognition? Um, the beauty of lacrosse nowadays is that the internet has made everything smaller. Um, the sport is also growing in lacrosse, or the sport is growing in lacrosse, or California, excuse me. The sport is growing in California <laughs> for the third time. Um, and so it, it is a, it's considered more of a hotbed nowadays. But if you want to get to a coach on the East Coast that can't get out to one of your high school games, that's the beauty of film. Sending your coach a two-minute video of not just you facing off, or not just you scoring goals, but you losing face-offs, playing defense, riding hard. That is the type of stuff that coaches want to see. They get 600 videos a day of guys scoring highlight reel goals. They get 600 videos a day of guys just roasting dudes going out the front on a fast break. They want to see what happens when the bad stuff comes because it happens to all of us. So if you can prove that you can win in a bad situation, if you can pick up a, a gutty ground ball, or even after your opponent picks up a ground ball and wins the face off, and you can strip him and then get the ball to your offense, that is what any coach in the country is looking for out of any state. Yeah. That's a good call. Anything to add on that? No, I just think you're right. It's Everyone is always showing their best foot forward, and I've heard college coaches say before, I get a highlight video. It's funny. I've never seen a kid lose a face off on a highlight video. Um, but what can you do aside from clamping, right? Because there's going to be somebody at campus who's better than you when you get to college at what you do. Uh, can you have the intangibles? For sure. Um... CBOT3, that's CBOT with two T's, Ooh. says, when someone is continuously beating you, what is your go-to move? So this is, at the Face-Off Academy, our goal is to get you ready for every style and to be uh, proficient in every style of the face-off. Yes, guys can clamp at nauseum. We know that. If a guy's faster than you at rolling his top sidewall over the ball, that can't just be the end of your day. So what do we go over? We go over how to use the bottom side wall. We, we go over uh, SNG, which is standing neutral grip, rake variations, pinch and pop variations, how to go belly to helmet. I tell guys all the times, I firmly believe that if me and a friend were messing around and we decided we were going to take 20 face-offs, that I can win 10 of them if I don't face off, if I don't clamp on any of the face-offs, if we're talking about possession. So you know, one of the things we talked about earlier in this podcast is the draw circle. If you're losing... Uh, the ability to be a quarterback and use your wings is vital. So I think if you're getting beaten on the clamp, which is I'm assuming what you're talking about, you should have the ability to go standing neutral grip, to use your rake, to effectively uh, nullify his ability to exit, to put your wings in the right position. So depends on how you're getting beat. If you're getting beat by a standing neutral grip rake, if we're going to go on the opposite end of that spectrum, then you should be getting doing a better job of getting your helmet over top of the ball and crushing down your clamp. So there's a, plenty of ways to lose, but there's also plenty of ways to counter how you lose. Your goal as a proficient, elite-level face-off man is to not worry about yourself. You should be able to practice everything. Your goal is to find your opponent's weakness and make him do that so that he's not as effective as usual. What do you think, Jer? Uh, I completely agree. I think getting to your feet nullifies just about anything in facing off because at the end of the day, your opponent or you has to do one thing that nobody else on the field has to do. We physically have to release the ball into the air. Now, if you can just knock that ball out of the air or catch it out of the air, it doesn't matter how fast your hands are. If you can start on your feet or get to your feet before your opponent, you make you make a, a giant into a mouse. Awesome. Now, Butch Clark 13 has a question that only Jerry can answer. Oh boy. How can I up my ramen consumption limit so I can be like Jerry? 
um, you just have to you just have to show up, just like college class, <laughs> <laughs> just like class, just like practice. You just got to show up and you got to crush bowls. Got to put the, put in the uh, work. You, you man. just got to put in the time. You, you know, I didn't I didn't just get there and they just started dumping gallons of ramen down my head. <laughs> I had to build up to three bowls a day. <laughs> <laughs> Heard it here from the master. Oh man. Um, and uh, how's our time look, Greg? We're good. We're, We're good. good. Let's Tremendous. ask a couple more. Let's ask a couple more. Okay. Oh, well, here's a good one. Here's one that uh, that I'm interested to hear about from Akira Fukuyara. Uh, when are you guys coming to Japan for clinics? So we are in the process now of buying our first FOA jet. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, I uh, look. We have been to Japan plenty of times. Uh, I know Fowler's been there. Jerry's been there. Um, has Train been over there? I don't think Train has, but Mattis has. Mattis has. So Chris Mattis has been over there. So the FOA has been over there plenty. We have a great following over in Japan. I personally haven't been there. That's something I have on my docket. Uh, the two countries that I have gotten requests from personally the most has been Australia and Japan. I plan on hitting both of those within the next two years. And as my playing career wraps up, my options will, will open up as well for, as far as travel. But obviously now I have a three-year-old son. Uh, I have a wife at home. I need to be home more often, so I have to pick my spots. But Japan is every guy who comes back, every lacrosse player who comes back from Japan has nothing but great things to say about it. I know they've treated Chris and Jerry and Fowler very well. So I definitely want to get over there. I'm uh, coming back. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Evan underscore Bolshazy underscore 2003. What's the best exit you can do if you get the ground ball after a lockup? Catch the ball. So I think what Evan's asking is, after a lockup, after you've been locked up for a couple seconds, mm-hmm. if you acquire the clamp, what's the best exit? That's a, that's a good question and a tough one. I don't think that there is a best exit, really, because it depends on where the wings are. So you need to make sure that you're using your peripheral vision, that's what you're not looking at when you're looking at the face-off, to read your opponent's feet. Try to... Take a look down the wing. See what color cleats your opponent's wearing. You know, if you're a red team and you see green cleats, well, guess which way you're not going. So if you see those green cleats out in front of you, a defensive exit is going to be your best exit to go out the back door. If you don't see any cleats in front of you, well, then a front door exit is going to probably be your best exit. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's going to be different exits for different times, but there's no time where a TTL is going to be your best exit. There's no time where a, going out the front is going to be your best exit. It's... We teach our guys to read every face-off as, as a developing play. You never go out there and go, okay, I'm going out the front. You go with what your opponent gives you. Yeah, that's a great point. And as most of you guys know, I have just joined First Class Lacrosse's online training platform. So this will be one of those things that we break down film to show you different options. And like Jerry said, you have to make it a visual cue. I think yelling things to your face-off guy in the middle of the game, um, another team's going to pick up. Like, I know Brody Merrill for years used to yell my name on lockups because he wanted me to pop the ball out to him. So uh, we'll, we'll get you guys that information on film. But just like Jerry said, you need to uh, multiply your exits based on what's coming up. Let's do uh, one more question before we uh, call the day here. One more question. Well, this is a good one for you because you have the, uh, the piece of paper that says you know about this. What is the best lift for a face-off guy? So <clears throat> the beauty of the face-off position, and, and this is an easy way to tell if somebody knows what they're talking about as a face-off man when it comes to strength training. So make sure you pay attention. If somebody spends their time telling you that forearm, that you need to build your forearms with wrist rolls and stuff like that, or if someone's telling you that um, there is one specific lift that is good only for face-off guys, that person does not understand either our position or strength training in general. So the beauty of the face-off position is that we just need to be the best possible athletes. So training similar to a wrestler, training similar to a safety or a middle linebacker, we just have to go out and be great athletes. Our biggest and most important thing is injury prevention. So I tell my guys, if we're looking at a hierarchy of a pyramid that's important for a face-off man, from top to bottom, the most important thing would be mobility. So you go mobility, joint mobility, uh, flexibility, then you want to go power and strength and endurance. So the most important lift that you can do is a perfectly uh, a proper squat or a proper deadlift. Um, those are the exercises that use the most joints. Those are the exercises that use your core. 
You can also add an overhead press. My specialty is Olympic lifts, so I'm big into cleans and jerks and snatches. So I love anything that creates power and increases my body's mobility and flexibility. So that's what I would say you want to focus on. But you have to have it done with an expert. You have to have it done. You have to learn how to do it correctly. Uh, because like I said, injury prevention, the shoulders, the wrists, the low back, all that stuff. I know Jerry had talked a little bit about um, you know what to hap- what happens if you are suffering from burnout. I think, what was it, uh, Jack Bird asked yeah. that question. For most of my guys, I tell them, look at your rep count. Like Jerry said, you want to keep the blade sharp as far as your technique. But I think the mistake a lot of you guys are making, and I know this is going to make no sense to some of you, is more is not te- necessarily more when it comes to live reps. If you go out and you take live reps, say you take 1,000 live reps a week, that's you're, you only ho- have so much tread on your tire. And we are doing a, a, a movement that is unlike every other movement in our sport where it's consistent to the right side. It's always the same every time. Your body's not built for that. So what we have to do from a training perspective is do the opposite. So if you're on a right knee and your right hip is bent all the time, we now have to unfold that and we have to put that pressure on the opposite side to make sure there's no imbalances because you're going to have a functional imbalance. So uh, the short answer is you want to go over the complex exercises, deadlift, overhead press, uh, squat, or cleans. You want to focus on your mobility and your flexibility. Anything to add to that, Jerry? Nope, I think you knocked it out of the park. That's why they gave you the piece of paper and not me. <laughs> All right, cool. My degree came up for something. All right, now, uh, this was our first episode. Guys, we want to thank you so much. Please share this. Please give us feedback. Use the hashtag FOASK. Follow the Instagram, The Face Off Academy, um, on Instagram. And then on Twitter, it's FaceOff underscore Academy. Please follow us. Give us your feedback. We want this podcast to be about you, about us. We want to have fun with it, so we're looking forward to our next one. We will do this every single month. Jerry, you got anything to add? Nope. Thanks for listening, guys, and excited to get the next one out to you ASAP. Goodbye. <laughs>